Let's talk about some biggest lies or some biggest misconceptions in the music industry. Here we go. Hey everyone, Cole Caparoon here. Thank you for stopping by for another video. Now my point with this video is to not trash talk anyone. It's not to put down the people that are saying these things. I would just like to share with you guys some things that are commonly said in the music industry and that I disagree with. So as always with anything I ever say, I want you to try stuff out for yourself. Do not just take my word for it. Anything that I ever tell you to do, anything that I ever tell you not to do, try it for yourself. And if it works for you, awesome. And if it doesn't, at least now you know. I just want everyone to do that with every piece of advice or information you ever hear. You should question absolutely everything and experiment with it. You should know exactly why you do what you do and exactly why you don't do what you don't do. Okay, with that out of the way, one of the biggest lies I see in the music industry, one of the biggest misconceptions is not using too much compression. Now, I've heard this a million different ways. Don't compress a vocal more than four or five dB. Don't compress on your mix bus. If your needles are moving while mastering, you're compressing too much. I've heard this so many different ways, and what I would like to impress upon you guys is how much compression actually gets used on different stages throughout production and throughout the mix. Now, I'm not going to put words in anyone else's mouth. I'm going to tell you what I do. And there's a link down in the description below to a playlist of tons of music that I've worked on. Go listen to it. If you don't like it, then don't believe me. <laughs> but if you do like it, here's how I got there. I commonly hit 20 dB of gain reduction while tracking vocals. Commonly. Now, that's the very peak but it, it will get there on most songs that I work on. I will commonly hit 15 or 16 dB of gain reduction when compressing that same vocal while mixing. And then that vocal hits my mix bus, which is getting another two to four dB of compression at the loudest point of it. And then that entire mix may or may not get more compression if I feel it's necessary when it gets mastered. If I'm mastering for another mix engineer and I can tell the mix has has not been compressed whatsoever, which is really common, then it's very normal for me to do two to four dB of compression on a master when I'm mastering someone else's mix. Now, for sure, there are some things that I'm barely even touching, like, you know, sometimes a, a kick drum or a snare drum gets one or two dB of compression. Sometimes I'm barely making the needles move. But use your ears. Don't not compress things. That's a double negative. Don't not compress things just because someone on the internet told you not to or because someone told you that you're compressing too hard. Really use your ears. Make these decisions for yourself and experiment and know why you do what you do. And don't ever stop experiment. I'm entering my 21st year of music production. I'm still experimenting every single week with stuff. Before we get on to the next thing, there's links down below. You guys know how this works. Links down below for every single piece of gear I use and pieces of gear that I recommend. Those links go to Sweetwater. Sweetwater is sponsoring this video. You can get just about everything that you ever need from Sweetwater. And if you use any of the links in the description of any one of my videos to purchase anything you ever need, it goes a long ways to help this support this channel. And I very, very much appreciate your guys' support. So thank you very much to you for using those links and to Sweetwater for for sponsoring this video. Let's get on to the next point, which is you can't master your own music or you can't master if you're the one that's mixed it. I've heard this a million different times that you shouldn't master stuff that you've worked on. You need a dedicated mastering engineer that has not heard the song before or has not worked on any of it before. Now, I'm not gonna totally discredit this, but people say it as such a hard rule, and I just, I disagree with that. In my opinion, in order to be a decent mastering engineer, you have to have really good monitors, you have to have a really good sounding room that's really well acoustically treated, and you have to have been focusing on the discipline of being an actual mastering engineer for a long time to be competent at. If you don't have these things, or you don't have the ambition to be a competent mastering engineer, then for sure, don't do do that hire a real mastering engineer. For many, many years, I was sending my mixes out to be mastered, and I was also mastering every single song that I worked on. After a year or two, I felt like my masters were just as good, and in some cases better, than the mastering engineer's masters, and at that point, I started giving blind tests to my clients. Do you like master A better or master B better? And there became a point in time when they were choosing my masters 80 or 90% of the time, and that's when 
one I felt comfortable considering myself a mastering engineer. So I don't think there's anything wrong with mastering music that you mixed as long as you're putting effort into being a real mastering engineer, doing it the right way. We're not just slapping limiters on stuff and calling it master. You can absolutely master your own mixes if it's something that you're willing to dedicate time to the discipline of. Next up, plugins do the same thing as hardware. <laughs> now, I do think that both have their use cases, both have pros and cons, but anyone that says that plugins are just as good as hardware, anyone who says plugins do the same thing as hardware, that's wrong. It's just wrong. <laughs> hardware does a thing that plugins can't. Full stop. My opinion, but I am I'm avid in this belief. Now that said, I use tons and tons of plugins on all my mixes. I know people that mix all in the box that are doing smash hits on headphones all in the box. So I'm not saying you can't get great results with plugins only. What I'm saying is they are not the same thing. And once you start investing in some hardware, you start realizing what the differences are, and then you can really start playing to your strengths. Oh, this piece of hardware does a thing that I really like, and I can't get the plugin to do that thing. So then you start being selective about what pieces of hardware you get and what you use them on. And I think that's the best way to mix. My personal opinion, there's no rules. There's tons of people doing great work both ways, but plugins are not the same as hardware. I've mentioned this next one in videos before, but it's that you should master at minus 14 dB LUFS for Spotify because Spotify is going to turn it down to minus 14 dB anyway, so you don't want to crush your mix too hard because then it'll sound quieter next to other things that were mastered at minus 14 dB. This is so wrong, it's unbelievable. And when this stat first came out, when, when this info first came out, I probably mastered a dozen or two dozen songs at minus 14 dB LUFS because that's the right standard. So that's what I did. And then they get released. And I'm like, why is it so quiet next to everything else? What happened? I feel like one of the great privileges that I have is, is working on so many songs every year that get released. I get to play around with stuff and, and I get to subtly change things uh, as we go through dozens of songs. And then I get to see how that translates to the real world. Uh, but this is, this is horribly wrong. Don't ever master anything or have your mastering engineer master to only minus 14 dB because it will be way quieter than everything else. The next Next thing is that high-end power cables make a difference. Now this might be controversial, some of you might disagree with me on this. I am a believer that cables do make a difference. Great quality microphone cables, guitar cables, patch cables, speaker cables, these things do make a difference and there are sonic differences between cables. But then we get to the power cables, and if you've ever been to a NAMM show, you're walking through NAMM and, and you see these booths set up, and these people are selling like three and four hundred dollar power cables that you're supposed to plug into your speakers or into your amplifier or whatever. And I just, here's my issue. Hey, if anyone out there makes these power cables, if anyone out there has a connection with a company that makes these super high end power cables, send me some. I'll do a whole video on it and I will be as unbiased as I can and I will just post the results and we'll see what people say. I doubt anyone's willing to actually do that because here's the problem is no matter what the power cable that goes from your wall outlet to your guitar amp or from your wall outlet to your studio monitors, no matter what that power cable is made out of, you are still limited by the cable that is in the wall. The Romex that's run from the breaker panel to your outlet, that's your limiting factor. And I just can't imagine a scenario in which three foot of a $400 power cable is going to undo all of that Romex that's 400 feet in the wall. Like I just, I don't get it. That, that's, don't spend your money on power cables. And again, please send me some. Anyone out there, send me some. I'll do a full shootout and I'll post the results. I'll, I'll post download links for high, high resolution download files so you guys can make the call for yourself. I'm sure there's tons more things. These just popped into my head and I wanted to make the video. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like, drop a comment down below. Hit me up on Instagram. Don't forget links down below for everything that I use and I appreciate each and every one of you and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.